colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Your Excellencies, Bula Menaka. Bula Menaka, and uh, very good evening to you all. Excellencies, thank you for standing with the Blue Pacific for this COP26 uh, high level event, leading the way to a 1.5 degrees world. As the name suggests, the Pacific region has come to uh, COP26 with a critical goal, a clear demand to keep our world to 1.5 degrees. This is uh, critical for the survival of Pacific nations and imperative for the well-being of the global community and the economies that connect us. We meet here in Glasgow as dire climate change impacts are being felt across our world. Right now, with global warming of over 1.1 degrees uh, Celsius, our blue Pacific continent is under siege from severe cyclones uh, rising sea levels, ocean acidification, and uh, erratic uh, rainfall patterns. For low-lying atolls, climate change has brought us to the abyss. We are being forced to normalize a state of constant existential threats. We are using words like resilience, innovation, and adaptation to deal with the trauma and disruption of the internal displacement of entire communities and coastal cultures, loss of uh, ancestral uh, lands, ravaged food chains, and natural ecological systems that are clearly breaking or are already broken. And now uh, we know you see us because we see you. We see flooding in Europe, in India, and China, bushfires, bushfires, sorry, bushfires and droughts in Australia. Severe hurricanes uh, in the Caribbean and the east coast of the U.S. and droughts uh, ravaging many parts of the globe. As you've heard uh, from the Secretary General, the IPCC's sixth report presents a clear condemnation of humanity's reckless abuse of the planet and a grim warning, grim, grim warning about the consequences of failing to drastically cut emission. Uh, carbon emissions. We also meet here in the throes of a global pandemic, one that has reminded us of our interconnectedness, one that has shown us we can rapidly adjust our lives, one that has put our world and economies in crisis, offering just a glimpse of what lays ahead if we fail to avert a global climate catastrophe. And yet, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, despite these warnings, despite the unprecedented impacts, despite the signs, our world is uh, off track to cut emissions, build resilience and reach the goals of the Paris Agreement. Many of the biggest polluting countries around the world, some of whom we consider our friends and allies, have abandoned their responsibilities and failed to take ambitious climate action. They have neglected their commitment under the Paris Agreement. A good friend will always be there in our, our hour of greatest need, and it is not too late to change course. We must act urgently. We must act with the future of humanity and uh, one blue planet in mind. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, in the lead up to COP26, I've been saying not to come unless you are bringing action. So I'm very glad to see you here, which tells me that you are prepared and have the moral courage to make tough decisions and to join the call for greater ambition. As the Blue Pacific Continent, what action do we demand from COP26? We need every world leader to take immediate action that limits global warming to the Paris Agreement's 1.5 degrees Celsius threshold. 1.5 degree is not just a preference. It should be a promise that we do not break. To keep the 1.5 degree pathway alive, all countries must announce commitments for serious cuts in emissions by 2030. We've heard that uh, over the last uh, few weeks, 
transition from uh, non-renewable fossil fuel based industries and a commitment to net zero by 2050. All countries must also work together to finalize the Paris Agreement rulebook. High emitting countries hold the levels for change. They have outsized control over our collective fate. They must take responsibility. Even if we achieve the 1.5 degrees threshold, countries in the frontliners, like uh, our Pacific Islands, are facing unprecedented impacts. Last year alone, the total economic cost of disasters in the Pacific was around $1 billion US. Tropical cyclone, uh, PAM, in 2015, caused damage amounting to 63% of Vanuatu's GDP. And tropical cyclone Winston in 2016 wiped off one third of the value of our GDP in 36 hours, in addition to the tragic loss of life. That is why at COP26, developed countries must deliver on the US 100 billion finance commitment. We are now at the end of 2021. Yet the US 100 billion expected by 2020 has not been delivered. This is unacceptable. Collectively, we must also establish a new climate finances, uh, finance goal for post-2025 with a better balance between adaptation and mitigation and dedicated finance for loss and damage. And for our Blue Pacific continent, COP26 must deliver the effective integration of oceans into the UNFCCC. Excellencies, the Blue Pacific is playing its part in the fight of our lives against climate change. Pacific Island countries, <coughs> excuse me, are the lowest emitting nations on earth. Yet, yet, we are not hiding behind the excuse that we are too small to make a meaningful difference or using COVID-19 as cover for not uh, taking meaningful action to honor our climate obligations. We are not shying away from our collective responsibility to head off this crisis. Fiji has committed to carbon neutrality by 2050 and have submitted our revised and more ambitious NDC. As of Pacific Islands Forum, the 2019 Kainake Lua Declaration, a declaration drawn directly from the COP 2015 Paris Agreement, continues as our clarion call for urgent climate change action now. In August this year, Forum leaders issued the groundbreaking declaration on preserving maritime zones in the face of climate change-related sea level rise. Excellencies of major concern for the Blue Pacific continent and the future of our island home, the IPCC report found that sea levels could rise by 2 meters by 2100 and a disastrous 5 meters by 2150. The declaration is a strong and decisive step towards securing our respective homes now and into the future. Forum leaders have also endorsed the established, uh, establishment of the Pacific Resilience Facility targeted at uh, building the resilience of at-risk Pacific communities through small-scale, high-impact grants. Currently, over 80% of global climate finance goes to mitigation, yet we know that every dollar we spend, every dollar spent up front on resilience and preparation saves approximately $7 in recovery costs. Ladies and gentlemen, Excellencies, our negotiations to resolve outstanding issues over the coming week remains our best chance to keep the 1.5 degrees threshold within reach and avoid a global climate catastrophe. The 1.5 uh, degree target can be reached because I believe in the potential of collective action and the power of humanity. I remain hopeful that the leaders of these countries, which have so far refused to act or have shown limited ambition, will do the right thing at the end of the day. The future of their children and our children rests on it. As the chair of the Pacific Islands Forum, ladies and gentlemen, as a Pacific Islander, as a current grandfather, I urge all of us to deliver the commitments to rapidly cut emissions and make this 26 COP the one, the one that turns our climate crisis around, us, around and cements a climate legacy outcome we can be proud of. Our window to act is now.
Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. The Honorable Frank Banyamarama, Prime Minister of the Republic of Fiji and Chair of the Pacific Islands Forum. The Honorable Aya Said Kayum, Deputy Prime Minister of Fiji. The Honorable Seve Painu, Minister of Finance for Tuvalu. The Honorable Stephen Victor, Minister of Agriculture, Fisheries and Environment for Palau. The Honorable Bruce Billimon, Minister of Health for the Republic of Marshall Islands. Right Honorable Lord Bennion, the UK Parliamentary Under Secretary of State and the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. Mr. Inga Anderson, Under Secretary General of the United Nations and Executive Director of the UN Environment Program. The Right Honorable Patricia Scotland QC, Secretary General of the Commonwealth. His Excellency Ambassador Dr. Ruteru, Chair of PITSIDS. Members of the Diplomatic Corps, Excellencies and Officials of Forum Members, Excellencies and Officials of Forum Dialogue Partners, Distinguished Guests, our Blue Pacific Youth Representatives, Ladies and Gentlemen, Bulavinaka Kiorana, and thank you for joining us this evening for the Pacific Islands Forum High Level Event, leading the way to a 1.5 degree world. It is my extreme pleasure to welcome you all on behalf of our Blue Pacific family and our valued international partners and friends. We meet here in Chile and wet Glasgow, thousands of miles away from our warm Blue Pacific. And for what? The answer is simple, because we care. We care about our future and the future of mankind. Excellencies, the recent IPCC report has shown us with devastating clarity that climate change has us heading for doomsday. And of course, climate change is not a theoretical academic subject. It is not a far off future scenario. It is here. It is happening, hitting us with floods, warming oceans, and rising seas. It is now, as we battle devastating cyclones, king tides, droughts, and wildfires. But the good news is that we have a window of opportunity to change this course right here in Glasgow and right now. We have an opportunity to respond to the resounding calls of citizens from across our blue Pacific, our blue planet, for ambitious climate change action. And we have an opportunity to shape a future that is resilient and sustainable for our children and for future generations. Yes, this is indeed a golden opportunity, but it is also a grave responsibility. Excellencies, friends, it has been an arduous first week of negotiations. While there has been progress, the road ahead is bumpy and challenging. However, I am assured by your commitment in joining us tonight to elevate our Pacific voice and ensure this COP holds to a 1.5 degree world. Our Pacific leaders have labored long and tireless for climate change action. And they continue to lead the charge, pushing for action through all avenues, including their recent declaration on preserving maritime boundaries in the face of climate change related sea level rise. Our forum leaders have also endorsed the Pacific Resilience Facility to protect and prepare our communities before a disaster strikes. In short, to build our resilience. Friends, let me once again thank you for joining with the Blue Pacific this evening. In closing, we call on all world leaders, all countries, especially the big emitters, to please adopt a new mindset, 
one with more compassion and more consideration for others. You see, after all, we share this one blue planet as our home. What you do affects me, and what I do affects you. Friends, we must make this moment count so that when we look back in history, we can say with pride that we played our part at COP26 in Glasgow to secure a safe and prosperous future for all of mankind. All the very best, and I thank you. Prime Minister Banyamarama, it's a great honor to speak before you today. And Prime Ministers present here, ministers, leaders of the Pacific, Secretary General of the Pacific Island Forum, Excellencies, distinguished guests, um, my sincere thanks um, for, for allowing me to be here today. Pacific leaders have taught us how to navigate. You are the master navigators. You know and you taught the world how to read the sky, how to understand the stars, and how to know how we move from one place to the other safely. You've taught us this as together you have rowed in the canoe. It is time for the world to listen, to understand and read the stars, understand what the world is telling us and act. Because as this COP got underway, some of the most powerful voices were from the Pacific Islands. We heard uh, leaders speak eloquently about the slow death climate change is inflicting upon your islands. And we heard yourself, Prime Minister, um, and speak also. And we were proud at the United Nations Environment Program to award you the Champion of the Earth in 2020 as Chair of the Pacific Island Forum and being that voice to the world. This region has long been the voice to speak for vulnerable communities. So I'm not here to describe your struggles to you. You are living with climate change. You are sounding the alarm on climate change. You are fighting climate change. I'm here to tell you that we at the United Nations have heard you. We stand by you and we will do what we can to elevate your voice. We will continue to remind the world of this. The UNEP's emission gap report, to which the Prime Minister referred, made it clear. We issued it with the, with the Secretary General just at the beginning of this conference that the world must have greenhouse gas emissions in the next year, uh, next eight years, to have a shot at 1.5 degrees, a temperature limit that could give your islands a fighting chance. We know the biggest emitters have the biggest responsibility here. We will continue to remind them of this. But as you know better than most, climate change is already here. We must step up our efforts to adapt, even if we limit the, goal, the global temperature rise to 1.5. As the UNEP Adaptation Gap report released just this Thursday made clear, adaptation finance is still too weak. As a bare minimum, the goal of providing the $100 billion per year in climate finance to developing countries must be met. And I remind the distinguished uh, participants here that this was a pledge made in 2009, that by 2020, there shall be $100 billion on the table every year. This is not news. Countries have more than a decade to prepare. And so at this point, meeting that goal is absolutely critical so that we can boost adaptation and help developing nations strike out on a low carbon development pathway while they invest in adaptation and resilience. Because the actual costs of adaptation will run far higher the longer we wait. And again, we will remind the world of its responsibilities, including on loss and damage. However, for the finance to flow and the right projects to be set in motions, countries need to set clear adaptation goals and targets, including through capacity building programs. We at the United Nations Environment Program, through the Asia Pacific Adaptation Network, 
are working together with your nations to develop framework uh, that can help advance this. And that would certainly dovetail with the national adaptation plans. We are committed to support the Pacific region and the Pacific island nations adapt and, and to invest in specific projects that works, uh, that can just do that. Distinguished guests, friends, if I may, the rest of the world must play its part in slowing climate change and helping island states to adapt to its impacts. Nations must pledge much stronger cuts to emissions. Nations must make good on adaptation finance. Nations must finalize the Paris rule book, most notably, obviously, Article 6. And nations must ensure that the ocean is more prominent in climate discussions, because the ocean and its health is integral to the heritage, the economies, and the livelihoods of small island developing states, and crucial to the world's climate. You are not passive victims in this global challenge. A Samoan activist, uh, Brianna Fruen, told world leaders at the opening in the COP, said that the people of the Pacific are not drowning. They are fighting. Keep fighting as you've done, and we at the UN will keep fighting with you. We know that you are the navigators, and as you raise your voice, Raise it loud. You have a moral high ground that no one can take from you. And that high ground can help us he reach safer grounds and higher grounds. So I thank you very much for this opportunity. And rest assured, we at the United Nations stand with you. Thank you. Uh, I'm grateful to all of you for making the journey uh, to be with us at such a crucial time for our planet and our people. When I came back from the Pacific Islands Forum nearly a decade ago, where, when you met in uh, the Cook Islands, I told my fellow parliamentarians that I'd been with people who were living climate change, for whom it was an existential threat, and to whom we should listen. But it's hard to get that message across to our constituents at the time when perhaps it was a remote thing. They could feel sorry, but somehow they weren't living it. But they're living it now, and they're listening to you. And I think this is an extraordinary moment uh, when the eloquence of the speakers tonight, and your champions as well, were just, um, just gets straight to the point. And that's why we have to succeed. Uh, and it, we, we must be clear. We cannot solve climate change without restoring and protecting nature on a massive scale. Yesterday was Ocean Day, and we particularly want to highlight our call for ocean action, which acknowledges that climate change is ocean action. It sets out how we want to keep 1.5 degrees within reach by ensuring that 30% of the global ocean is protected by 2030. Collaborating through the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development and increasing finance, increasing finance for marine nature-based solutions. Our £500 million Blue Planet Fund includes £400,000 in technical assistance to support the government of Fiji in developing their first sovereign blue bond. Now we know we must do more, but we think this is the sort of thing that countries like ours should be doing and should be doing now. And we look forward uh, to our ocean conference in Palau next year. The question I was asked uh, in these short remarks is, are we on track? As a representative of the COP presidency, I'm of course going to be optimistic, cautiously optimistic, but I want to remain optimistic nonetheless. I was earlier this, this afternoon with Al Gore, who's attended most of the 26 COPs uh, that there have been, and he said that this is by far the best. He senses at last that alliance between politics, economics, science, 
and people uh, is being felt and there is real determination to move forward and if we want to be perhaps risk being over optimistic we can see the calamitous views of some uh, a decade or so ago that we were heading for eight degrees and there are some people saying that the agreements reached so far brought us down to 1.8 degrees that is in itself a, a, a fantastic story but it's as you so know in your region uh, not necessarily true there's a whole week to go and not necessarily something that we can sit back and bank and it is vital it is vital that this next week we see the kind of uh, difficulties that are in every negotiation and all those words that are in square brackets uh, can be uh, taken forward with the people that you represent here in mind we absolutely have to meet the goals we've set ourselves we must failure is is not an option and the pacific islands know this better than anywhere you are crucial partners in ensuring success we're dedicated to working with all parties to facilitate consensus at this cop and we have seen so many commitments already and this is the momentous momentum that we must keep up we are now halfway through and we have much to be proud of and a lot more to do and i hope you will continue to work with us as you have done openly collaboratively and in friendship we will continue to call for the world to make big commitments to invest in clean energy and phase out coal to accelerate the transition to electric vehicles and abandon polluting vehicles to deliver on the promise of the richest nations to deliver on that promise to raise at least 100 billion pounds in climate finance per year to support developing and climate vulnerable countries to adapt to the impacts of climate change and to restore nature and habitats and halt deforestation coals coal cars cash and trees these will be the measures of success if we truly can keep 1.5 degrees alive thank you again for inviting me to be with you this evening